Good afternoon, Columbus Realtors. I'm John Giha, your CEO. Welcome to our first 2021 town live town hall here at Columbus Realtors. I'd like to, and I'm very excited to introduce our 2021 president, Michael Jones. Michael, thank you. Welcome. John. Thank you very much, and welcome to you. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, we're excited to be back in the building and excited to have this first town hall. Um, thank you for joining. This is actually for you, our members. Our goal is to take this opportunity and inform and have a meaningful dialogue. Uh, that's how we're going to be able to move forward and improve as an association and as professionals uh, in, our, in our work that we do um, and simultaneously enhance consumers' experiences. So we're going to go ahead and get started with some things. Um, we're going to highlight this at this town hall, uh, our growth and expansion through equity and impact. Over the last year, we've had some great strides and even into 2021, um, starting with uh, the promotion of our staff member, Lynn Hackworth, as manager of equity and impact. Um, we have uh, done things through our housing affordability or affordable housing community more recently, um, moving our needle for, for the uh, benchmark for the affordable housing number from 180,000 to 215,000, which is very interesting. Um, as we see times change and the economic factors uh, impact every segment of our buyers and sellers market, we're seeing that that's one that has significantly moved as well. Uh, during this year alone, we've had three events uh, with Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee um, being able to bring to the forefront some of the um, issues with housing um, and, and stability and uh, inequities within housing. Uh, we had Bill Dedman uh, in our January event with the Long Island uh, New York illegal steering investigation. Uh, later, we had uh, Dr. Rothstein uh, discussing, Richard Rothstein, yes. Dr. Richard Rothstein discussing some of the inequities that have taken place that have adversely impacted generational wealth opportunities for people uh, for generations, quite frankly, again. Um, and most recently, we had Dr. Eddie Gloud uh, on with our book club, who was able to provide some ex exceptional insight uh, as well as having our some of our elected officials, including Commissioner Marilyn Brown, uh, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, um, and City Council Member Emmanuel Remy as part of those discussions. Um, and we also have with our impact sustainability, a, a growing sustainability forum that is uh, making great progress. Uh, we're looking forward to a, an upcoming event. If any of our members would have any interest in volunteering on April 22nd, uh, for the Earth Day event. Please be sure to reach out to someone on staff so that we can uh, get you registered for that. I just wanna also, again, be encouraging and let everyone know that we plan to open the building to members uh, at some point very soon. We are working to develop some of the criteria for having people back in the building safely. That's the most important thing. Uh, I know everybody's anxious, but we don't wanna do things too quickly. Uh, to our to our demise, so to speak. Um, but with that, I'm going to ask John if he would weigh in a little on the NAR lawsuit as well as the Department of Justice settlement that is in front of us right now. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Michael. Uh, as you know, there is a class action lawsuit that was filed against National Association of Realtors and a number of brands, as well as 20 other MLSs throughout the United States. We are not a party to the lawsuit. We are actually called a co-conspirator to the lawsuit, which means we've been subpoenaed and we are working with our outside law firm, Baker Hostetler, to help us work through the lawsuit. We've also joined a joint defense group with 19 other MLSs throughout the United States to help keep our costs down. We're currently in the subpoena phase, which means that they are actually pulling data from Columbus Realtors and the other 19 other MLSs, they are looking for anything that is tied to conversations about commissions. We hope to be out of the subpoena phase within the next three to six months. We have been meeting with our law firm and we've also been meeting with our accounting firm, uh, with Ray and Associates to make sure that Columbus Realtors is positioned financially to withstand and deal with the cost of our legal defense. 
We are, we're very healthy. We have been prepared for this and keeping both the law firm and the accounting firm together working to make sure that we are moving forward with this lawsuit. Where it's going to play out, we don't know. If it's gonna to go to trial, if it's gonna to go to settlement, uh, we're not sure where they're, where they're headed. It could still be another 12 to 18 months before there is a decision, but we hope to be out of the subpoena phase within, as I said, the next few months. The Department of Justice and NER negotiation, that was not a lawsuit. And I think there's some confusion by that. They've, some people have felt that, the, or have heard that the DOJ have, has filed a lawsuit against NER. They have not. That is a negotiation. They are currently working on the rules of the changes that they've incorporated. They will bring those uh, rules changes to the NAR board of directors, we hope in May. That'll go back to the government for their approval. And once the government approves the NAR's decision, they will then bring it back to all the local associations. The two biggest issues with the DOJ negotiations with NAR is the Buyer Brokerage Commission and the transparency with that Buyer's Brokerage Commission, as well as all licensed real estate agents will have access to Blockbox and Keybox. We are preparing for that now. Uh, we have started to structure because we will be able to set the guidelines and rules and cost and that everybody will be treated equally and fair across the board. And we currently have a foundation and a format for these rules and regs moving forward. So we're, we're staying in touch with uh, Katie Johnson from NAR. We're working very closely with Baker Hostel or outside counsel to make sure that we are on top of things. The good part about the class action lawsuit with Baker Hostel there, out of the 19 lawyers, three are primary negotiators with the plaintiff's lawyers and uh, Rob Tucker, our lawyer, is one of the three. So we are staying on top of all the information and keeping apprised of where they are throughout this, this lawsuit. So we'll keep you posted as we learn more and we'll make sure that we are responding quickly and prepared for any changes that come to us. Thank you very much, John. It's, sure. so, it's so important that we understand the impact to uh, our members and we want to make sure that you're aware that we are very much, as John mentioned, on top of it, uh, working as we need to with uh, necessary changes as they will come about for our standard forms, listing agreements, et cetera. Um, I'm just curious, are there any questions at this point in the chat uh, for the Department of Justice settlement or the NAR lawsuit? Again, this is for you, the members, to be able to voice concerns, ask questions, and have general <clears throat> discussion with us surrounding the important issues in our industry. So <clears throat> if you have a question, there's two ways. Uh, you can type your question in the chat, uh, and we will read the question back and answer it the best we can. If you would like to speak, please put in the chat that you would like to speak, and we will unmute you as an individual one at a time. All right, there is a question in the chat. Uh, what is concerning buyer, broken, buyer broker commission transparency? That's a great question. Um, it's not, we're not sure what the impact will be until we know what the rules are. The reality is the buyer brokerage commission is going to be uh, very visible to the pub, to the consumer. And I think that's the, yeah, where the list, this, seller will have an option not to pay the buyer brokerage commission and that will be paid by the buyer. That is one of the impacts of this change. How the final rules come out, I'm not sure yet. Um, and we're waiting to hear. Uh, we don't, uh, NAR is not sure what the final rules are. They're currently in that negotiation. One of the other impacts is an opportunity to step up again as professionals. We stress this a lot um, and it will help the narrative in general, which might have even led to uh, why this is in front of us anyway. Yeah. It's oftentimes said that uh, you don't pay my commission or my service is free. And that's led consumers in many cases uh, to be misled uh, or not to completely understand how people are paid, who's paying the commission, et cetera. So uh, we see this as an opportunity to step up and talk about representation, roles, how we're compensated, et cetera. So the impact, again, to John's point, is yet to be seen, but we can take the lead by being transparent with how we represent people, how we're compensated, and steering away from discussions that talk about 
I, I offer my services at no cost or my service or representation is free. It's not free, it comes with a cost and who's paying it needs to be clear and transparent to everyone. So while we're still waiting on the rules and waiting on the outcome of how we'll have to deal with this, that's one area that you can already step up and be proactive with the approach, change the narrative completely. All right, we do have another question. What is the lawsuit about again? The NAR class action lawsuit is uh, really the, the transparency of commission and the seller feeling that their cost of, of their, they had to raise the price of their home to pay the commissions. And they feel that the value of their home was greatly impact because of the commissions. And that also there are members of, that are not realtors, that are real estate agents feel that they are impacted with the data on MLS or not being able to get the information off MLS because they're not a member. So there, here's the other issue. You have copycat lawsuits that are taking place as well. And it's really boiling down to information and the commissions that are paid, the value of a home that's tied to the commission and who's paying the commission and what is the transparency of that commission. Because there are copycat lawsuits, you have seller so, um, class action suits, but you're now seeing copycat lawsuits where the buyer brokerage side of the transaction is now under investigation with potential lawsuits. You have real estate companies that are not realtors filing lawsuit against NER and against Zillow. You have brands suing each other. And it's all boiling down to data, information, and commission, and who's paying it. Keep, Keep the questions, questions coming. coming. Um, great, great opportunity to continue the discussion and make sure that everybody's informed. Uh, this is our uh, forum to kind of make everything available to our membership, which is really important to us. And we also ask if you want more information about this. NER has done a phenomenal job of posting on their site information and updates. There are videos and there are articles that are pertaining to the lawsuits, the DOJ negotiations and the settlement. So I strongly encourage you, be careful of some of the sites that you go to. Some sites are headlines and they try to sensationalize this issue. Also be careful listening to some outside speakers that may make a mistake in what they're actually discussing. If you go to the NAR site, you're going to get some very good information. And we're staying in touch with Katie Johnson, Chief Counsel of NAR, to make sure that we are up to date as well. Uh, since the uh, uh, first announcement about the Department of Justice and the, uh, the issues about sellers not being able to negotiate buyer brokerage commissions, um, I, many of us remember back, I'm going to say it's probably been between one and two decades, that it was typical that we would go to a closing and it would be a day or two before we would receive a check from the title company. And over time, it became uh, increasingly common that uh, we would receive that check at the closing. And uh, we all know that in a cooperative transaction, uh, there's never a written agreement between the seller and the buyer's agent directly uh, with them being principals that we're going to get any kind of a commission from it. It's always a cooperative agreement uh, through the through the board uh, or through the MLS uh, and the board, I guess. Um, my question is, why wasn't this just squashed by saying, okay, we're going to go back to the situation where the seller's brokerage is simply saying this is a business expense that we're paying out of our pocket after closing, uh, the same way that a broker or an agent pays for a photographer. You know, we absorb that cost into our expenses. Uh, we decide who the photographer is going to be and we hire them and we get the job done. Uh, I'm not sure why that uh, same approach isn't handled. And we go back to the point where we're actually getting a check from the, uh, from the other brokerage. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, great question. And uh, it's always good to have a logical approach and, and what you're presenting is very logical, quite frankly. Um, unfortunately, as I was describing earlier, the narrative is simply different coming from different, different brokers, different realtors and different uh, parts of our industry. The concern has been 
the consumer seller in this case has felt like they've been harmed or damaged because they've not had the option. They've not been given the choice of how much to charge, et cetera, like commissions aren't negotiable. And that hasn't always been effectively communicated to the consumers. Uh, and in the same turn, that's going to happen with buyers in much the same way as this, as this transition takes place. I think that, uh, again, how we communicate information becomes very critical. And that, uh, that's likely the result of why we are where we are today. Information hasn't been communicated as effectively as it could have been. Sellers haven't been informed how the commissions work and the fact that part of that commission is negotiable or the commission totally could be negotiable as well as we are sharing a commission. The, the information simply hasn't been adequately explained. And that's why it's so important that as professionals in this industry that we do step up, as I had mentioned earlier, that we do take control of the narrative and explain and with, with great transparency. So I think had that happened in the beginning, we probably would not be where we are today. I think that your solution, uh, as, as logical as it might be, we're beyond that point because obviously we're in a lawsuit stage and we're working through, our NAR is working with the Department of Justice on a, on a solution for this, but completely understand your question. Um, I think we're just beyond that at this point. John, do you have anything that you wanted to add? Um, no, I'm sorry. I've, I apologize for that. Uh, we're asking that all questions be sent to Lindsay Jones. Uh, so that Lindsay can see, I apologize, we, uh, were, some of our questions were being missed because they weren't being sent to Lindsay. So please send your uh, questions to Lindsay. And no, Michael, you said it very well. And I think it's very important that we understand that the direction is going to come to us. Uh, it is, the reality is it's communication between the listing agent and the seller and the buyer's agent and the buyer and working very closely together, you're going to, your buyer's agreement, buyer rep agreement, uh, and the decision that the buyer will pay the commission on their end, uh, that communication is gonna be vital as we come out of this, uh, this whole process. So we hope that sometime in May, if not the beginning of June, we will understand the instructions, Mark, and we will get those out as soon as possible to all of our members. And we'll do this in many ways. We'll get the information out via video. We may do another live town hall. Hopefully we can do it someplace where we can get together. Uh, we will do it in print and we will make sure that it is posted on social media. So just stay tuned and we'll keep everybody up to date what the rules are. All right, we do have a few more questions coming up. I'm gonna go ahead and tie two of them together. They are pretty similar. Uh, any insight into allowing all licensed agents lockbox access lockbox access and then someone else stated you mentioned all licensed realtors will have access to lockboxes how is that different from today currently today not a member of the mls you don't have access to a lock a lockbox or key box what will change is there are members that are not realtors or there are agents that are not realtors they're licensed real estate agents in the state of ohio and what the difference is, they will now have access to uh, MLS, uh, the lockboxes within an MLS corporation. So they will have the opportunity to get, we're, we're currently with Supra, they will be able to get a one day code with Supra or get access to a key box through Supra as a member of our MLS currently today. So that's really the difference. Uh, we. What's very important is we use an electronic lockbox. So we do have safeguards and security. We know who is using the lockbox, so when they're using it, uh, how long they're in the home. And we're also putting in some safeguards. If, if there's abuse to the lockbox, we will uh, make sure that we address that right away. Uh, part of the application process that we're currently working with, and we're going to bring that to our outside counsel to confirm if somebody does abuse a lockbox, we can turn their key off instantly. So we're making sure that it's all, um, everybody is equal across the board, that the rules meet everybody's needs, but that we're also protecting, and what's very important about this is protecting the consumer through the entire process. Sure, thank you for that, John. And just for clarification, uh, again, 
the, the licensees in the state of Ohio will merely have equal access with the seller's consent to access the lockbox for individual homes. It is not across the board. It is not a absolute. Uh, we <clears throat> simply have to provide equitable access to the key, if you will, uh, and that's likely what we'll see as a result, a result of the Department of Justice agreement. But again, we will work very diligently to make sure that our members remain protected and that our members' listings remain protected. Uh, sellers have to be in complete agreement with it to provide that access. Yeah. So we will be very, we are, we are still developing ideas for the rules surrounding this, but we'll have to be very specific and act upon and within the confines of the Department of Justice settlement. All right, there is a comment. Uh, very unfair that a buyer's agent will have to publish their compensation to the public. There is no other job that requires people to divulge such per personal information. Is that a question or <laughs> is that a, a statement? That's a statement and, <laughs> okay. and, and I would completely agree that uh, it is unfortunate but as we've described uh, in the earlier comment from Mark, had we done things differently in the past, perhaps we wouldn't be here today. Now we're simply playing the hand that we're dealt. Um, and at the end of the day, we should not be ashamed of what we're earning, how we're earning it, as long as we're performing and providing a service. You know, it's not much different than a, a, a law firm having, you know, an hourly rate for their different classes of attorneys, whether it's a senior partner, junior partner, or associate. Uh, we're simply publishing what our what our commissions will be. Um, I don't think it's as big of a deal. It is unfortunate, but it's something that we will too. Uh, we will certainly come out of this with no issue. I don't think. And even in the past, in my past board, we had to deal with this, and it was uncomfortable at the beginning. But everybody has uh, settled in, and the relationship really between you and your client, uh, you and the seller. It's what's extremely important and your communication with them. So it will not uh, hamper how you do your business. It's going to be very important. The communication level is very strong. Yeah, the, tr the transparency, I think it's so important. And again, controlling how the conversation goes rather than sitting at a commission or at a, at a closing and looking at the commission and across the table at your client and seeing that you made $9,000, for example, just have the conversation in the beginning. Uh, right. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And if we do more of that today, we will likely have less opportunity for somebody to come in after the fact to, to basically tell us how it has to be done. Thank you for the comment. All right, there is a question. Uh, so when we are asked, what is the brokerage fee? What do we say it is for? We don't want to say the wrong thing. I, I would ask that person to give um, more detailed to their question. It sounds like you're talking about uh, an administrative commission or fee that each broker may charge separately above and beyond the traditional commission. Um, that is up to your individual brokerage yes. as to how they're going to describe what that fee covers. Commissions and fees obviously are different, uh, but each brokerage has their own right to charge whatever they're going to charge. And that's a very individual thing. So it's not our space right here to kind of dictate or mandate what that would be. Is anyone working with the mortgage industry to allow buyer agent fees commissions to be rolled out into the buyer's loan? Most buyers are unable to make down payments and commissions for their agents. Let me just jump and I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Yes, we are in conversations. We're looking at every aspect of how this will impact certain uh, price points within our community. And we have started talking with uh, lenders and banks about this, uh, and this is new to them. Uh, they have not heard the direction that we're headed. So we actually have a meeting next week with one of our major banks here uh, to discuss this exact uh, issue. Yeah. Because we understand it's not just the down payment, it's the commission, but also the impact that it could have on appliances or issues within the home and how does that affect somebody's ability to buy a home and I know Michael you have had some very deep conversations recently about yes. that. Thank you John um, and again uh, in an effort to uh, for 2021 and a vision beyond we are looking to be a part of the solution before the problem presents itself 
So we are very actively engaged with lenders, not only locally, but statewide and nationally about solutions and how we can work towards an equitable approach on how everybody can continue to participate in the American dream of, of buying real estate. We do recognize early on that there will be some disparate impact for people in the affordable housing arena that simply don't have the, the capital or the means to support a commission like that. So there, there will be ways to work through this. And again, by looking at it up front, we can craft the best solutions possible. This does not mean, uh, so to be clear, this does not mean that the seller cannot continue to pay the commission. Uh, this is simply transparency in explaining who pays what. Uh, so it can still be a matter of negotiation. We're looking at this today and knowing that when the rules come out, there will be some, some change. There will be some, some, some activities that, that you know, change how we've done things. But it doesn't mean that we won't ultimately get back to a place where the general practice is the impact of the practice continues to be the same. So again, we're, we're highlighting that this is in front of us today. Uh, we're focusing on the fact that there will be changes and how the business is done, but we can still kind of create the, the framework on how we do that. So I, I think it's a great question. We are on top of it and trying to work towards a solution. Um, we don't have the answer today, uh, but also the problem is not being, uh, the, and I shouldn't say problem, the, the change isn't being implemented today. We are still ahead of the curve and trying to work towards a solution before it's in front of us. All right, there is another question on key boxes, or I'm sorry, lock boxes. Uh, what is the potential impact on allowing all, all licensed agents access to lock boxes? Interested to know your insight into the ramifications. Because we're in a position that we're able to set the rules, set the cost, and because we use electronic lock boxes, here from in most part in Columbus and Central Ohio, we can follow and track what is taking place. Again, I don't see this, and as Michael said earlier, which is an extremely important point, it's still up to the seller to make that decision. But because we use electronic lock boxes and we have the right to put our rules and regs within the guidelines and a cost to do this, I think we will minimize the impact there's always gonna be a situation, a circumstance that you know, could happen, but we're gonna stay on top of it. And I think if we were a mechanical lockbox within our community, that would be a lot more difficult to manage and to police this. But because of the electronic, it gives us a great opportunity to know and monitor the data with that. So I, I'm hoping that the impact is minimal but we are going to stay on top of it and our rules and regs are going to meet that need. All right, the next question. What is the likelihood that the buyer will be responsible for paying the buyer's agent's commission? Do you foresee that this requirement will be covered in the buyer's loan? It's entirely conceivable that the buyer could be made responsible for their commission. Um, the ability to get that financed or make it a part of their loan like closing costs still up for discussion. We've put it in front of mortgage bankers so that they can begin to figure this out. Uh, as John mentioned next week, there will be a meeting with a, a local bank to try to work through some solutions. Uh, but right now, um, I would say be prepared to have your buyer uh, expecting to pay your commission. Be prepared to discuss how they pay for that. Be prepared to discuss how much that's going to be. Be prepared for the conversation and address it with great transparency, integrity, and honesty. Uh, it does not mean, as I said earlier, that you could not negotiate with a seller to pay uh, commissions. Quite frankly, and another topic that we're going to get into is the multiple offer situation that people are looking at right now. And we're already seeing, in some cases, the buyer willing to pay the seller's closing costs, which is a turn in events that we've never seen. So because the Department of Justice will have this agreement or settlement with NAR, we're still able to work within the confines of that. And it may very well include that we are transparent with who's paid, how they're paid, and who's paying it, but it doesn't preclude you necessarily from saying that the seller will pay the closing costs or the commissions. John? Yeah. No, you said it, Michael. I think, uh, again, and I'm repeating myself, but it's communication. 
and is communication before you get too far into the transaction or even to the search and making sure that everybody, you are knowledgeable about the process and that your buyer or seller are knowledgeable about the process. And what's gonna be very important is education coming out of Columbus Realtors to help our members know how to address this and you, really the language to use. So we're not going to uh, just have this happen and not have education and not have information made available at your fingertips to make the transition a lot easier for you. Great question. Yeah. All right. Uh, is there an FAQ sheet on how to communicate commissions correctly? And that's what we will make sure we have that. Once we understand the rules um, and understand the changes, we are going to make sure that the education, the information, and the FAQ is made available. And again, we're going to do this in multiple ways, either through, through video like this, live town hall, through print, uh, through the classroom. We will make sure that our members have complete information available to them and the step-by-step -step process. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a best practices, and I'm certain that the Broker Advisory Council will have some input, uh, and individual brokers will have some input on how they think that's most effectively communicated, since it is a broker commission. Yeah. And we, we have some very strong brands here in Columbus that will be managing their education through their companies. We have some very strong independent brokers with very powerful education components. They will be delivering that in education to their members as well. So uh, it's going to be working with Columbus Realtors, but also working very closely with the, our brands and our independent brokers so that we're all on the same page together. All right, there is a comment. Uh, very interested in the education that has been provided during this pandemic and the flexibility of the online meetings. This allows me to get so much more work done and I can attend many meetings on the road in between clients. This has been a great benefit to me and I hope that it continues. I have completed so much education and have been able to attend many more meetings and events. Please continue this and no charge is always good. Thank you. What, what a comment. comment. I love yeah, hearing that, great. so positive. Yeah, and we're, we're working very hard. Actually, I have a meeting on the 22nd with Superintendent Ann Pettit to address the online classes, the hybrid classes. Well, I'm going to, Kelly will be joining me in that lunch just to make sure all of Kelly's questions are answered. But we do know that our members have enjoyed the opportunity to take classes online. We also know we have a number of members, a light, a high percentage that want to come into the building. So working with the hybrid model, uh, we, we feel this new technology that we have, the ability to do what we're doing here today and to do what we've been doing with our Zoom classes, it's not a technology we wanna walk away from. We want to continue to develop that, but also make sure that we don't walk away from the live classroom. So Kelly is working very hard to work through the hybrid process. Our technology here, we've upgraded it to make sure we can do this, but it's very important that we work closely with the superintendent to make sure we're all on the same page. Also, I just want to give everybody an update. The live class or the free classes will continue through the end of June. We will go back to a fee-based class at an hourly rate at $10 per credit hour in June. And the reason we're doing this is that we have uh, covered the cost for over a year now, but we're still paying the instructors. And so this cost that we're going to go back to in July is really to cover the cost of, strictly the cost of the instructors moving forward. All right, the next question. Uh, will they also have the opportunity to get full MLS detail or just the key boxes for entry into the home? I believe this is back to the lock boxes. I, I don't know that we Good have question. that clarification. No. Uh, generally, you know, with transparency, and it sounds like you're asking, will they have access to uh, basically agent to agent remarks? Otherwise, every field that's in MLS, including the description and eventually uh, the commissions, I'm certain, since they have to be available to consumers as well, they would have access not to our MLS by any means. We still maintain a member-based organization 
and we have rights to do that. Uh, this, this settlement, from what I understand, is merely providing equal access to properties. They are licensed, duly licensed in the state of Ohio, so they will have access to the homes. Uh, we have to provide limited access based on, uh, based on the DOJ settlement to the lockbox. And again, the consumer or the seller does have to be in agreement with providing that access to somebody who's not a member of our MLS. We will have to look very carefully at the rules that are set forth likely in May uh, from the settlement with DOJ to determine what information has to be made available other than just basic access, but they will not be members. They can be offered membership as they always are, but we maintain a member organization and we have rights within that for sure. And we will fight tooth and nail to make sure that that is continued uh, and honored. And we had a conversation with Katie Johnson, chief counsel for NAR two weeks ago, and they are adamant and they're very focused that the rights to have membership and to have access to the data is a membership driven relationship. And we do, as Michael said, and NAR is strongly uh, focused on that to make sure that if you want the information, like any other organization, you join as a member. Great, Great question. question. Have we as a board decided to use CenturyLock? I believe I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, uh, John, I'll let you take this, but absolutely no. Uh, our association, our board of directors, our leadership has not made any such decision. Uh, we remain open to learning about options and services that are available. Um, also, brokers at this point are utilizing um, Century Lock, perhaps in some cases, but that's a broker level decision. At the association level, we have not made any such decision. Uh, we will always remain open minded about opportunities to partner or utilize various services, but to, the, to date, we do not have any such agreement. No. And when and if our contract comes to that point that we have to start negotiating, we will open it up and investigate every single opportunity for our members. As we do with any large expenditure that we have here, we are looking and we will do an RFP, uh, a right for a proposal to make sure that we're not just saying yes to a current contract. We're going to look at the best opportunity, the best cost, the best product. We do that with our accounting firm, an audit firm, our legal firm, our banking. That is very important to us as we move forward to make sure we provide the best services, the best protection, the best tools for all of our members. So when the contract is due to expire, we will make sure we investigate for, for fully uh, what is available to all of our members. Thank you for that, John. I think when I was answering the question, I was looking at it from a showing perspective because CenturyLock, I believe, is introducing their showing platform. They just announced it, yes. uh, Which <clears throat> is what brokers are using. Uh, but as an association uh, for lockboxes specifically, and I guess that question wasn't real clear because now as we see, many organizations uh, that are in our industry are getting into different segments of our lines of business. Uh, what was a lockbox company is now becoming a showing service company. So everything is evolving. Uh, great question. And sorry if, if I confused anyone with my response. All right. I have clients telling me they do not want me to use dot loop or showing time as they feel Zillow has too easy of access uh, of their contact or contracts and number of showings. Isn't this a breach of confidentiality for a competing brokerage to own the companies which store our clients' contracts and showing stats? That's, That's a, a great, great question. question. Um, that acquisition by Zillow um, of acquiring showing time has not been completed yet. Uh, so as of today, Zillow does not currently own showing time that is still under investigation, which is normal at this level, at this price point by the Federal Trade Commission. So nothing has changed at this point with Showing Time and Zillow. What happens after? Uh, in the world we're in right now, we have to all understand this, that major corporations are getting into our space. A very high percentage of all of our applications or real estate related entities 
are owned by major corporations, and that's not going to stop anytime soon. Uh, you have entities such as Zillow, you have entities such as CoStar, but right now we don't know what will happen with the relationship between Zillow and Showing Time, but it has not been a completed transaction uh, transition at this point. And we continue at the association level to make various companies and services available. Uh, for example, forms. Um, the Zillow group has owned uh, Dot Loop for some time now. That's not new. So owning Dot Loop and having access to that information is not has not changed. I'm a firm believer that they are honoring the requirements of confidentiality and not breaching. Um, that Chinese wall, if you will, for lack of a better term, that divides the two entities and access to information. But that's why it's so important that as your association, we're providing access to many different uh, form vendors. So we continue to provide that and make it available to you as, as individual members and as brokers to utilize so that you have a choice. Uh, we do the same thing as it relates to showing services and are continuing to look at the various platforms, uh, I think we have up to eight now mm -hmm. uh, that we have been uh, vetting or evaluating so that we can provide you the most accurate information and the fullest assessment of the services that they offer so that you can make the choice. So you don't have to use dot loop. Uh, you don't have to use showing time. It's a choice. We continue to provide access to information for other vendors in those same areas. Thank you for the question. Yeah. And if you want further information or would like to participate, uh, Sean Simpson and Brent Saunders from our BizTech Forum are heading up a team that, with, along with Sade from Columbus Realtors, that are investigating the different showing systems. They've done a great job of compiling the list. Now they're going into a deep dive and they, they will bring this information back to the board of directors where we move forward. So there's, as Michael said a moment ago, Everybody's jumping into the showing business now. HomeSnap has announced they're going to start a showing system. NAR through Central Lock has started and just announced that they have opened this up. Uh, we also have Supra announcing they're going to start a showing system. There's a couple companies out of Canada, one called TouchBase, one called Broker Bay. And showing time is still an entity. Where we end up, It'll be working with Sean and Brent, uh, Brent Saunders to get this information and bring it back to the board. But they are doing a deep dive, looking at every product, looking at the price point and making sure that we provide the information. All right, we do have another live question. So Ms. Sharon Rigsby, I'm gonna go ahead and prompt you to unmute yourself. If you could please accept that invitation. And whenever you're ready, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. So my question was just around that transparency to the public around commissions. Um, would this be a space where the association is now looking to require agents to use a buyer exclusive agreement with their buyer clients to have that level of transparency around commission that is expected since the listing side has the listing contract where there's some transparency there? I think that, thank you for the question, Sharon. Um, from a transparency standpoint, exclusive buyer representation agreements remain optional, uh, but are highly encouraged, um, but they're not a requirement. I think that it's important that we make the distinction between uh, best practices and requirements by the Department of Justice that are going to be uh, handed down to us. Uh, the transparency of sharing commissions is what we're talking about. The best practice of using an exclusive buyer agency or exclusive buyer representation agreeing that is a, a requirement unless your broker is specifically requiring it, but mm -hmm. highly recommended. All right, the next question is, have there been any have there been conversations about how the current market is causing uh, a disparate impact for low income community? Yes, um, John, I'll, I'll start. I, I think that again, as we look at the commission um, and who's paying commission, we've started looking at uh, how that again has a disparate impact on communities that are 
quite frankly, limited by income and, and means and resources. Um, and it's a huge concern of ours. And we are trying to get in every room that we can and scream that at, at our, our highest level and say, how do we fix this? It becomes a very difficult thing um, because it's, it's all about dollars and cents, quite frankly. Uh, it's, it is unfortunately impacting uh, other specific communities in, a, in an unequal way, uh, but it's not because of access to fair housing as we are in this fair housing month, it's, it's pure dollars and cents. So it's something that is, is not only on our radar, but again, we are trying to get in every room that we can to kind of scream this in advance to try to find solutions on how we can make equal access based on these limitations. Uh, I'm gonna let it is um, coming soon in curb offers because that kind of plays into the challenges that are in our market today and how people are or are not, as the case may be, able to compete in this market. So, John? And thank you, Michael. And this is a, a very important topic. We are involved very deeply with this. I sit on Home Ports Board, as well as Land Trust and Advisory Committee. And this is a very important topic. We're also, Michael's involved in a number of our team, and, as well as myself. Involved with, it is uh, headlined by the Mortgage Bankers Association out of Washington, D.C. I was privileged to be able to go down to Memphis to see how this was rolling out. And this is bringing all the entities within the community to address housing needs. Columbus is the second city in the United States to bring convergence. We're in the process of developing the actual platform, working very closely with the MBA and our stakeholders, our relationships. We're very Proud to be part of that and very proud that um, entities such as Huntington Bank are heavily engaged with convergence. This is a hot topic because it, it's not, it affects the long term growth of the region. Uh, working with Kenny McDonald at One Columbus and what Jobs Ohio and the BIA, this affects all of us as we drive jobs into central Ohio, making sure that we have marketplace, their market priced housing, and we have jobs and transportation that affects. And if we start losing people because the affordability gap is too wide, it affects the economy here in central Ohio. So it is a very important topic. Convergence, we're very excited about being part of convergence and having a, being an architect with the design of convergence and that's bringing everybody together to make sure we address this issue. Thank you, John. Um, again, we don't wanna take away from any questions or concerns that anybody has. This is again, our forum, uh, your opportunity to kind of put things on the table. So we're gonna to transition to this other topic, but if you do have questions that we're not getting to, please make sure that you submit them to Lindsay Jones so that she can get them to us so that we can get you responses. Uh, we will figure out the best way to publicly respond so that everybody has the benefit of the answers. Yes. Um, some of the other topics that I mentioned of uh, many of our members uh, we're experiencing include coming soon and curb offers. Uh, there are two hats that we'll wear. Uh, we will all likely wear these hats representing buyers and sellers alike. So we'll be on both sides of this coin. So best practices become very important. Uh, how you behave and interact and, and uh, generally perform in these situations. I want you to always remember where you represent a buyer and you're very tenacious with what you wanna do and expectations from the listing agent and the seller in this case. Remember, you're gonna be on that side one day and how will you wanna be perceived and, and interacted with on that other side? And remember that as you, as you go through that process on either side. But we know that there are concerns uh, because of our limited inventory right now. And uh, I was sharing with somebody the other day, it's not uncommon, our, our practice right now is you have potentially a coming soon uh, that starts you know, Monday, uh, one week, and you begin showings. It becomes active on Friday and all of the showings begin. So sellers are basically bracing themselves for uh, showings Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And in some cases, nonstop, 15 minute increments all day for all three days. And they're prepared to then evaluate offers on that Sunday evening or 
cut off for our highest and best offers by that Sunday evening and make a decision the following Monday morning. Uh, so we're kind of preparing and that seems to be par for the course. Can't stress enough on that Monday afternoon when you have decided on an offer, it's so important. It's also important that our consumers don't have that information before their realtor, your colleague, is able to convey that the nine offers of the 10 um, weren't accepted. Uh, the last thing we wanna do is diminish our professionalism and let the seller see on some alternative website that the property has gone into contract. So please, 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 make sure that you're effectively communicating. Maybe you delay things by a two hour before you update an MLS to just give yourself and your realtor colleague on the other side of the transaction, the opportunity to communicate with their buyer that you didn't win this offer, unfortunately, so that they don't see it on some other website. Uh, but again, we wanna open questions. I'm gonna turn it to John. Uh, we wanna talk about best practices as much as we can right now, because we can't necessarily solve the concern of inventory today. But what we can do is play the hand that we're dealt and operate in the most professional manner possible. So John, do you have any other comments? Well, we're going to really increase the level of information coming out of here to our members on best practices. One of the tools we're going to use, Matt from MLS is going to start doing MLS minutes to, to on video to drive this information. Michael, the most important message you just gave is communication between the realtors. The, we need each other. We have to work at a very high level. There is a lot of stress and frustration with this. And it's not just here, and I'm not trying to diminish this. It's not just here in Columbus, but it's throughout the United States. And there's a great four-part series on Inman called Insanity, Inventory Insanity. There are four different articles. I strongly recommend you read those articles because it does address what's taking place. And in, in our inventory issue, it's not the lack of listings, it's just the mar market that is so hot and that's causing the coming soon and the curb offers to really expedite itself and really show itself. But communication between you and your seller, you and your buyer and you and the other real estate professionals that we have here is vital through this whole process. If you have questions about the rules and regs, reach out to us. Uh, there are classes that we are conducting. We'll make sure we continue those classes, but we'll make sure we continue to drive the information out to you. Yeah, we have a great problem. People wanna live in Columbus. How do we win with that? That's the real solution. Yeah, exactly. Any questions that weren't answered, please email ljones at columbusrealtors.com. And we will get back to you. A couple of very important dates, Michael, unless there's some um, other questions, but we have some key dates coming up and I just wanna make sure that we highlight these for you. As I said earlier, July 1st, that's when our CE classes will be back to a fee-based class. Uh, we are going to a new membership system in June. Uh, we currently use a product called Rapid Tony. We are upgrading to a very extensive change a very user-friendly, membership-friendly change. It will affect accounting, it will affect education and events, but it'll have a membership portal. It's called MMSI. Uh, we have been working with the vendor since last year. They are building it out for Columbus Realtors. There are a number of entities throughout the United States that use MMSI. It's a very vibrant system. So that's gonna be coming in, in June. Also, the very good news, uh, Michael and I worked very closely together on the merger with Marion. Uh, the Marion Real Estate Board is now merged with Columbus Realtors. There are 87 members that have moved over or are currently moving over to Columbus Realtors, and they will create a area association, Marion County Realty Association. Uh, so we're very excited to welcome Marion to Columbus Realtors. There'll be um, other announcements coming out about that. Uh, Michael um, has uh, asked Sue Van Workham, our president-elect, to head up the MLS strategic planning. That is uh, currently underway right now. We will finalize the MLS st strat plan on the 29th of April. Uh, the congressional roundtable, as you may have read today in Brent's Three for Thursdays, has been postponed. 
because of a scheduling conflict with one of our uh, congressional leaders. We want to make sure that we have all three here. So please watch for a date that's coming soon. And again, Earth Date on April 22nd uh, at uh, Berliner Park. Please reach out to a member of the staff, Ida or Lynn, if you would like to participate in Earth Day. And the Ohio Legislative Week, Michael, April 26th through the 29th and mid-year legislative meetings. Now, you made a comment about the meeting you had today with NAR about yeah, members getting engaged and involved. Yeah, I think uh, we wanna encourage all of our members. You know, oftentimes leadership is expected to participate at the highest level, but there's an opportunity also for our general membership to participate at the NAR level on a committee. Uh, those appointments are, uh, I think the, the date went into uh, extension to, until May 22nd of this year. If you have any interest, please reach out to some myself, John, or anybody on the staff to get into that process uh, to make that application for an NAR appointment to a committee. And Realtor Care Day, June 9th. So please watch for more information coming out. Very important, the Core Pack um, virtual silent auction on the June 24th through July 8th. The auction itself is July 8th. Ida has done a phenomenal job. Uh, she told me that we have given back to the community through the actual foundation, not through CORPAC, but through the foundation last year, $75,000 back wow. to the community. The CORPAC golf outing is going to be live in August, so please watch for details. But on the 24th of June, we have Arshe Cooper, the author of A Most Beautiful Thing, as a continuation of our book series. I've personally read the book. I couldn't put it down. It's an outstanding true story about the first black crew team high school crew team coming out of Chicago's West Side. And it's a first person story by R. Shea Cooper. And he will be um, on live with us on Zoom. So Michael, this is one of many. We're gonna continue to do the live town hall. We hope that we can do it together, but if not, we will continue to do it via Zoom. Thank you, John. Thank you for uh, putting this together. Thank you to Samuel, Marquet, and Lindsay for your support. Great team. And thank you to all of the members that are participating today. We appreciate your, your engagement and want to make sure that we're addressing everything that's in front of us. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm John Giha, CEO of Columbus Realtors, and I'm here with your 2021 president, Michael Jones. Michael, good afternoon. Good afternoon, John, and good afternoon, Columbus Realtors. We are, as we promised, that we had a great town hall and quite a great audience, a very good audience uh, that, the other day, but there were a number of questions that we could not get to because of time constraints. And as we committed, we are going to read a number of the questions off. There were some duplicates, Michael, so we, we're not going to read them all, but we'll answer them. Um, I'll just read some of the questions that we received from our members. and. Just to be really clear, this isn't the end of this either. If there are additional questions, we'll continue to address them for the membership. Absolutely, we encourage uh, dialogue from our members. We wanna create as much understanding and transparency as possible so that everybody is on the same page and can move forward effectively. Good, so let's get to some of the questions we received and thank you. Uh, for all the questions and participating. Michael, there is a question that came back about the lawsuit and they want to know who initiated the lawsuit. And this is the class action lawsuit. Sure, well John, I'm gonna let you take that and maybe give a breakdown of who the named parties are and how we are a part of that, but not necessarily a named defendant in that, in that, um, in that action. As our legal team calls it, we're a co-conspirator. Uh, with this. The lawsuit was actually started by a group of consumers uh, in, I think it was in California, and they then filed the class action status, and that was approved by the courts, and the, what took place with the class action lawsuit is they named NAR in the lawsuit, and they named a number of brands, such as Realogy Brands, uh, uh, Better Homes and Gardens, Century 21, Cobble Banker, they also named Berkshire Hathaway, Keller Williams, and Remax, along with 19 other associations throughout the United States. So it was initiated by a group of consumers, and I believe from California. 
Okay. okay. Uh, and again, our, our role in that is somewhat limited. Uh, could additional lawsuits come down the road? Absolutely, and it's, it's very possible, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Yep. Next question, is anyone working with the mortgage industry to allow buyer agent fee commissions to be rolled into buyer's loans? Most buyers currently are unable to make the down payment and the commission. To, of their agents. Yeah, great question and we did touch on that just briefly during our town hall, but um, we have brought it up again to the mortgage bankers nationally so that we can look at them working with brokers and, uh, and mortgage lenders across the country, not only locally, but we're also talking to local banks like our Huntington Bank, which is a, a hometown bank despite their size at this point. And they may be able to do certain things that might be a little bit different. So we're working to, to solve the problem, not only locally, but nationally as well. So the discussion has been started. Uh, again, we're attempting to be in front of all of this before anything is mandated. Um, so while nothing is required right now, we we know that it's coming. Uh, we are, we're anticipating it in every way possible, and we are getting in touch and in front of the right folks who can make those decisions or at least introduce opportunities to, to change how uh, commissions are being potentially financed instead of paid out of pocket by a seller. Good. And then just to piggyback off of <coughs> the Department of Justice and the class action suit, Michael, there is a question that came up have we just thrown in the, the top and raised the white flag uh, to that? And I think you and I both can address that. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, we're not a, a, a party to the lawsuit, so we are not being directly sued. We have been subpoenaed, so there's nothing that we can do. The subpoena came. We are required to uh, follow the process through the subpoena. And the subpoena with us right now, the stage, as we may have shared the other day, is they're pulling data from us. So we've given the plaintiff's lawyers a feed and all of our emails from Stan, our former CEO, myself, and our former MLS director. One of the things they're looking for is any conversation as it is focused on commissions. So that's what they're searching for. But there is, uh, I will tell you that NAR is fighting this. There are 20 associations in this currently, and all 20 are fighting this with legal counsel. And there's the joint defense group that is fighting very hard to resolve the issue. So, no, I don't think anybody's given in or thrown in the white, uh, or raised the white flag right now. Yeah, I would completely agree. Uh, we're simply playing along as we're required to by law. Uh, and that's specifically for the lawsuit. As it relates to the Department of Justice settlement, that has been created and it is yet to be voted on by the NAR Board of Directors just next month. And I think that we will have a resolution on that. We know what it's expected to be. It again is a settlement and it will be final. It's not an admission of guilt or wrongdoing by NAR. It's simply an agreement to do things a little bit differently. Um, again, that will be likely approved in some form or fashion in May, and we'll see the results of that and, and understand better which direction we're going. But again, as with everything that we're looking to do this year, uh, we're looking to look beyond what's in front of us and how we can solve it ahead of time. So some of the things, even, even the nature of this discussion, is in an effort to get in front of and begin to uh, prepare for what's coming. So that way it just doesn't like turn off like a light switch. We're going to kind of ease into this process with new documentation yes. uh, that we're actually currently working on, rules to be developed uh, as they relate to lockbox access access, et cetera, and then making sure that all of our realtor members understand uh, what this means to us. So there will be more discussions, perhaps uh, not necessarily a town hall, but additional videos that will come out that will explain all of that uh, step by step. Excellent. So let's get into curb offers. There is a question here. Please give me the simple answer to what a curb offer is and how it works and how it's tied to coming soon. And so I would say, just like with anything, there are nuances. There is no one single offer. Conceptually, somebody makes an offer, another party considers and accepts or, or counters. In the case of a curb offer, it's 
likely in an attempt to circumvent the entire process of going through a traditional showing, uh, more so getting in, making things happen at, a, at an accelerated rate. Um, and we oftentimes see it, it's not, curb offers are and by no means new. They oftentimes happen very frequently with multifamily properties and tenant occupied properties. The goal is not to disturb the tenants. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, that's spelled out usually in the agent to agent remarks. So curb offers are not new. It's simply an offer with some contingencies and oftentimes the contingencies include a satisfactory viewing of the property within a certain time period. That could be within 24 hours, it could be within 48 hours, uh, sometimes it's not there at all, but it's not really any different than a traditional offer, it just comes sight unseen, so there are some protections oftentimes that the buyer or buyer's agent may want to put into the contract to protect them. As it relates to coming soon, um, again, not much different. Um, we know that people are doing it in an attempt to give themselves a leg up um, and take a, maybe a little bit more vulnerable of a risk as we're seeing consistently with a lot of the things that are in an offer anyway. Uh, limiting inspections, paying above the value of a home, Buyers in this market are very anxious and they're clamoring to purchase homes because of the limited inventory. So in the same vein, many buyers are electing to maybe compromise what some of their rights would normally be, and maybe that is foregoing an inspection. But they're simply trying to beat the process or get ahead of the process. Um, we've always seen ways that agents attempt and their, uh, help their buyers to kind of create that edge or that extra opportunity. This is just yet another way to do it and it's being done in a way that with an exercise or practice that we, we do and we do it frequently with multifamily and investment properties already. And the bottom line with a curb offer, the consumer, the seller, has the say. And really what the consumer, the seller wants to do, what we must follow. As long as they give us direction in writing, they have the final say of what they do with the curb offer and do they accept it or not accept the curb offer? Yeah, we just encourage as much ethical behavior as possible. Every, all of these things can be done in a professional and ethical manner, and that's what we all must strive to do. Uh, I encourage you, I implore you to do this. Uh, I, I'm constantly reminded that this market is part of a cycle. It's not a bubble. It's just part of a cycle. It will change. We will reach a healthy balance of inventory with buyers and sellers alike. We won't constantly see the same thing. So how you behave today will be measured at some point in the future. New construction starts are up. So we're the inventory, they're trying to get as much on the market as possible. And interest rates are still holding strong um, at a low rate right now. So the market, uh, the economy is healthy, but you're right. Um, if the more we have inventory, uh, and the stronger we will have our market moving forward. So, Michael, we have a question talking about off or brokerage exclusives, and let's talk a little bit about that. Somebody doesn't uh, believe that it's fair the way it currently works in the marketplace. Yeah, I, I can see that perception. The thing we have at Columbus Realtors is an appreciation for every business model and every agent's ability to choose where they want to work. Um, everybody has a choice in this process and they can choose to follow the business model that supports what their business model, what their individual agent's business model is. That's the best we can do in this in this environment, and that's what we seek to do. That we have we we have within our association several different business models, yes, we um, and we we seek to appreciate and support them all equitably. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Absolutely. So, next question we have: um, Do you ever see a day where Ohio licensed agents can belong to one statewide MLS? I live in an area that is one hour. Um, radius from five MLSs and I don't want to join five. Certainly. Um, that's kind of a loaded question. I'm really happy that we are in the process of doing our MLS strategic plan. Uh, that's certainly something we can introduce. Uh, when you talk about a statewide MLS, who manages that? Who's responsible? Um, I just, you know, we have individual um, MLS's for a reason and they've become regionalized like our own and there's a benefit to that. Um, 
but I, I just feel uh, personally uh, a concern with having a statewide MLS. I don't know how effective that's going to be, especially with major metros in Ohio like Columbus, Cincinnati, and, and um, Cleveland, and I'll include Dayton as well. Um, I'm just not sure how that would be managed as effectively as, as it, it could be or should be. Um, and maybe the state takes over smaller areas that aren't part of a regional MLS like ours, um, and that might be another consideration. So all on the table uh, for thoughts, and you know, let's definitely reach out to our uh, strategic planning uh, committee to see what they think about it. And we are researching, we're talking to other MLSs uh, areas around the state of Ohio. We're talking to the region as well. We're trying to find out because with technology there is a way to share data. Uh, there's work behind that. Uh, so I don't know if there's going to be a real need for one MLS today as much as a data sharing and that technology to be able to share data. Yeah, access so, to the information would be helpful. Right. Yeah, And we're talking, we know that for FBS Flex Lexington, Louisville, Northern Kentucky, uh, currently FBS, so we're talking to them about how do we work together in some cost savings or shared services, but it's just the investigation process right now. So, Okay, great excellent. question. And Michael, next question, do we expect to maintain a relationship with HomeSnap? Have they shared how CoStar acquisition will change their business model? Are there any concerns now that CoStar has announced that they're buying homes.com? I'm going to let you take uh, that question because I know you've been doing some deep dives and research and having conversations with some of the leadership in those organizations. I'll say that um, we expect the Columbus Realtors to continue uh, on a continual basis, evaluate the relationships that we have. Um, and as long as they continue to make sense, they're value add for our members and they're cost effective or we can make it make sense with the expenditure, we will maintain those relationships. But at any time that turns the corner, we will give it serious consideration to make a determination. Is this, is this something that makes sense, continues to make sense for us or is it financially uh, prudent for us to continue this path, down this path? And we remain open to, to all of those options. It's, it's moving very quickly. It's happening. You have Catalyst that is worked with our COSI members. It, it, their vehicle that was acquired by Moody's. You have CoStar acquiring HomeSnap and Homes.com. Uh, you have Showing Time acquired by Zillow. These things are going to continue. Our role is to make sure that our data is protected. Uh, make sure that we read our contracts thoroughly. We're talking to the leadership of all these entities. Uh, and you hear that age-old statement, nothing's going to change for now. And then we underline the for now. We know things are going to change. We will stay on top of it. We are asking the questions we need to ask. We're looking at our requirements and our obligations within the contracts. So at this point, even the showing time, acquisition. That's not completed yet. That's still under the investigative process with the Federal Trade Commission. So not much is going to happen with all these acquisitions until the transaction is closed and then they can actually settle and see what direction they want to go. So stay tuned. We're staying on top of it. Just like our showing systems, we are reviewing multiple showing systems. The BizTech Forum uh, that's led by Sean Simpson and Brent Saunders, they are researching with Sade and they're forming a committee to really take a deep dive in all the showing systems. And it was a question that also came up. Um, we have a non-member that is researching uh, with Sean Simpson the showing systems. And it was really very interesting to watch him through this process because he had a whole different level of questions as a participant, not a practitioner. And so he added to the questions that nice. they were asking. So it gave us a different viewpoint. A broader dynamic for yeah, sure. it was. So, That's excellent. awesome. Um, here, here's a question, and they don't know if it's appropriate or not, but let's ask. They've noticed recent trend of listing agents after multiple offer situation to increase the list price to match the highest offer price. Um, 
So this is a kind of, it's not a loaded question, but it's a, a very appropriate question and I appreciate it. I appreciate all of the questions. Um, they're not offensive. They're not specific to a, a, a deal or transaction uh, that, that's, that we're dealing with or are considering or investigating. So it's a very appropriate question. Changing the price in MLS after um, something goes into contract is prohibited. It is an MLS rule. It cannot be done uh, with the exception of perhaps a note from the seller, a, a document signed by the seller, and then something that goes to MLS for a request for a change. But you cannot do it if a listing agent with the permission of the seller, which is a requirement by the state law, as well as our MLS required uh, rules. If the seller directs the buyer, or excuse me, directs the listing agent to raise the price, that's what they must do. Mm -hmm. um, it is not necessarily encouraged. Um, many people find it bad practice. It does not leave us with having um, true statistics at the end of a given month to understand how much houses are selling above their list price. Um, so it's not a true measurement of, of good data in all cases. Um, but it, if it's the seller's wish to have this done, it can be done. Uh, it must be done at the seller's request. But it also suggests what the contract price is, which is some concern for some folks. Um, and then there's always if you don't have an appraisal contingency that supports the buyer bringing more money and it doesn't close and you have to go back and lower the price, what have you really done? Have you done any damage to your seller? I mean, it's, it's again a loaded question, but baseline, it is prohibited from an agent adjusting the price after something goes into contract. If it's done prior to going into contract, you must have the seller's permission in writing to do so and we always follow the wish of the seller. John, do you no, have any other? good. And if you have questions, reach out to Matt at the MLS um, or Karen Thompson. Reach out to Janet uh, and ask the questions before uh, you go any further, and we'll address this. One of the things that Matt is going to do, he came up with a great idea. We're going to start MLS Minute, and there are going to be a series of videos addressing key issues that we're going to be made available. We'll put them in print as well, a link, but the videos are going to be addressing key issues on an ongoing basis moving forward. So we're trying to address every question, the coming soon, the curb offers, broker exclusives, the DOJ settlement, the, N the MLS class action lawsuit. All these are very fluid. Uh, it, we will continue to provide written information and updates. We will also provide video updates for everybody. But there's also a number of links that we're going to be able to, we're going to post here that you can go to the, to actually see the DOJ updates and the video from NAR. You can go and read the information about the class action lawsuits. And we will continue to post everything here at Columbus Realtors. So, Michael, there, these are ongoing questions. We will continue to answer these questions for everybody. Comment that I would like to make, a, I'd like to get your feedback. We need to work together with each other. This is an industry that, especially in a market like Columbus, we know each other. The board of directors function extremely well together. Our chairs of our committees have functioned very well together. And they're all from different brands, all different size real estate companies. Address this. You've been in the business long enough. How important is it, this relationship between realtors? And you look at your board as the chair of the board, and you see everybody from different companies and different size organizations. How important is that? Critical. It is critical that we work collaboratively and collectively in everything that we do in this industry. Um, I'm reminded of complaints. And we are a, a fairly good self-policing organization. Um, in policing, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to report someone. 
it is a courageous thing to be able to pick up the phone and call your colleague and kind of share something that might be a violation or might be inappropriate. I ask that we work together to do that. That's how we become better. Um, nobody enjoys a fine. Nobody appreciates having their wrist slapped publicly. Um, there's such an opportunity to simply pick up the phone, shoot an email. I prefer or recommend that you would pick up the phone and have a conversation with another agent or another broker. I've done it and as I, I sit here and speak about it now, I will continue to do it because it's the right thing to do. When I see wrongdoing, I'm going to call it out or at least dr address it with the person who's doing it because otherwise it's never going to stop or we're going to be waiting until somebody else has the courage to click the report button or to submit a complaint or to ethics through, uh, through professional standards. And we just know from experience that that oftentimes doesn't happen. And if we work together, to your point, that's one way that we can begin to solve some of these issues and concerns. And quite frankly, I found a lot of them come from a lack of understanding, not an intentional uh, effort to do something incorrectly or a wrongdoing. So I think that we're all, I know we're all fairly intelligent folks. And if we do the right thing, pick up the phone and communicate, and it's in everything that we do. As I talked about the behavior and how we conduct ourselves today, going forward in a different market where it is perhaps a buyer's market and you're in a transaction a year from now or two years from now, that same agent who you maybe didn't perform so well with uh, is going to recognize and remember your conduct. Uh, and it's so important. I, I don't want us to be short-sighted in this environment. And it's not just among realtors. It's industry-wide that we're seeing behaviors and conduct with people that seem to have the upper hand today. And that table will turn. And I just want everybody to be prepared. Treat others as you want to be treated always, not just when it's convenient. Excellent, Michael. Really appreciate that. We're committed to supporting you. We're doing all the research that we need to do. There's a lot behind the scenes that's currently taking place. As I said, we're looking at all, everything to deal with MLS. We're looking at the applications. We're looking at showing systems, making sure that we have the information. And we're working very closely with our outside counsel and our uh, accounting and auditing firm to make sure that Comus Realtors is safe and secure during this process. We are paying very close attention in direct communication with Katie Johnson at NAR based on the DOJ settlement. As you said, Michael, it goes to the board hopefully in May and then it will come back to the government and they will finalize it and approve it and then come back to the boards. We're paying attention. We have already started the process of creating our rules for lockbox and keybox for all members and realtors and non-realtors, the licensed real estate agents which we have a right to do. We're already starting that process. We're working very close with the, the officers and our board of directors to make sure that we're all up to date with what's taking place. I do recommend that there are a number of sites you can go to and you can be kept up to, up to speed and up to date with what's taking place, not just the lawsuits, but with technology. Uh, one of the sites I would definitely go to the T360 site. Uh, Stefan Swanepoel is always updating information, what's taking place, and they have a pulse of uh, what's happening around the United States. RIS Media, R-I-S Media, it's a free site. You can go and they do updates. Inman.com, you have to pay to get the detail of that, that article. Be careful because a lot of it's sensationalized, but there's a lot of good updates. The Real Deal. That's a site, realdeal.com. It's a paid site, but their information is national, and they focus both on residential and commercial. Great site to go to. And then Real Trends, realtrends.com. Those are all sites that you can read. They get, they're updated almost on a daily basis. They keep you up to speed. We will continue to provide you information and update of what's taking place not just here in central Ohio, throughout the state and actually throughout the country. So it's a fluid situation. We know it's fluid, but we have to stay on top of everything. Thank you for bringing that up. And I would encourage all of our members, I know oftentimes it's not easy to participate in a town hall, follow up with email questions. Go with the path that's, that's the easiest path. 
having the dialogue and the communication is so important. My ask, John's ask, and, and from a leadership perspective, please make sure that if you're on some social media site engaging in discussion and conversation, bring us into the conversation so that we can help participate. Unfortunately, I'm not always on Facebook, so sometimes you need to figure out how to, how to loop us in. Tag me in a post. Um, so that I can be alerted to participate. We want to reach you wherever you are. Uh, and we know everybody won't see this video, but again, we're trying to reach people wherever they are. John, I want to thank you and the staff for all of your work, your diligence towards getting solutions or working towards solutions, answers, research, etc. Samuel, thank you. I just really appreciate the support from our staff for our members. It's so important, and uh, you guys do a great job. So Michael, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Stay tuned for more videos coming up. Watch soon the MLS Minute. Stay healthy and stay safe. Stay safe.